All right. Well, we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into it. Would you join me in praying, family? Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't ask you to come because you're not already present in the people that belong to Jesus. We don't ask you to come because you're already omnipresent. You're everywhere present. When we say come, when I say come, Holy Spirit, what I'm saying is to remind us that only you could blow the wind of grace into the sails of our life and move us towards Jesus to the glory of the Father. I have one simple request, that Jesus would be magnified, that his grace would touch our wounds, that his hope would touch our hopelessness, that his power would touch our weakness, that his clarity would touch our confusion, and that his love would touch our disappointment. Meet us in such a profound way that we will never ever be the same. We are not leaving this place until we are different. So Holy Spirit, would you come in magnificence and beauty? We pray this in the matchless name of our King, Jesus, and God's people said, A to the man, A to the man. Well, we are in, uh, I'll pick that up, A to the man. Um, that is what's called he bro. Okay, I'm very fluent in Hebrew, so you'll hear some A to the man. So uh, Pastor Rick tasked me with sermon number three in the series, Shaping Your Future Self. Shaping your future self. You want to live in the present in such a way that your future self is already sending you an email saying, thank you. But here's something we got to grasp, though. King Jesus cares about your future self and my future self more than we do. Why is that? For those of us who follow Jesus, Jesus cares about our future self and our development and transformation more than we do because the Bible says this, for everyone who's trusted Jesus as Savior, as King, as Forgiver, as Redeemer, we are now supernaturally a part of his body. The Bible says that we are literally the body of Christ. The Asian person, the black person, the indigenous person, the white person, the person who's black and white at the same time. Everybody is literally the body of Christ. Theologically, Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of his father. And if Jesus is sitting at the right hand of his father in God's domain called heaven, how does he move on earth? Through me and through you, the body of Christ. So your future self is not about you. As a matter of fact, I think someone should write a book that starts with, it's not about you. <laughs> in other words, tapping us into our purpose, our our future self is, is this, is that literally Jesus wants to invade earth with his kingdom. Uh, let me gently nudge you. So many of us as Christians are trying to escape earth, and Jesus said, do on earth as it is in heaven. We're trying to escape, and Jesus is trying to invade. And how does he invade? Not with armies, but with the people of God, with love in their hands and compassion and mercy. So today, we're going to learn how to cultivate the holy habit of seeing what God sees when he sees you. For those of us in Christ, if you're not yet in Christ yet, this doesn't apply to you, but it can. We're going to develop the holy habit of seeing what God sees when he sees you. One of the Darwinisms you hear at Transformation Church, not, not Darwinism, but one of the Darwinisms is this. The scene of the crime is your mind. And so, sow a thought, reap a habit, reap a habit, determine your destiny. And so we want to have thoughts that are not stilling our future, but actually building our present so that our future matches who God has called us to be. So we want to develop holy habits. Um, years ago, in a galaxy far, far away, in the 1990s, 
Uh, I was a professional football player. I played five years with the Indianapolis Colts, one year with the Carolina Panthers. Now, when you make it to a certain level, everybody's talented, everybody's big, everybody's fast. And I know some of you guys tweet on players and say how you could do better. No, you can't. They would eat you. I promise you, at 50, I would eat you. With a broken back, I would eat you. I mean, it's serious. Um, but here's the thing, though. When everybody's really, really good, what makes the difference is you develop habits. You don't rise to the level of the moment. Listen now, teenagers, young adults, millennials, Gen Z, you rise to the level of your habits. And so we want to develop holy habits. We want to learn to see what God sees when he sees you and me. Now, right off the bat, many of us and the dark powers are whispering in your ear and whispering in my ear, and it's like, well, hold, hold on, wait, Pastor Derwin, I, I don't want God to see what I see. I, I don't want God to remember what I've done because I'm really trying hard to, to make up for the things um, that even my spouse doesn't know about. So, so let's just move on from this message of God seeing what, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want him to see me. Well, I got some really good news. You ready? The moment that you said yes to Jesus, when God the Father now sees you, he sees Jesus. You're like, how does that happen? Because of this supernatural exchange. On the cross, God exchanges your unrighteousness and my unrighteousness for Jesus' righteousness. And the Bible says that we are united in Christ, that we are forever in Christ. Let me put it to you this way. Back in the day, we used to have uh, teenagers and young adults when in school, we would have this stuff called white out. When you make a mistake, you put white little stuff on it and it whites it out. Well, God has blooded out our past. That in the, yeah, we can clap about that. Yeah, that, 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 that in the blood of Jesus and through our union with him, when God the Father sees us, he sees Jesus, and you know what God the Father is saying? He's saying this, I want you to see what I see. Because when you see who I've recreated you to be, you will be the person that you're destined to be. So how do we learn to see what God sees when he sees you and me? Number one, believe that Jesus loves sinners like you and me. Number one, believe that Jesus loves sinners like you and me. And, and so let me clear some things out of the way because in the 21st century, and, and oftentimes as Christians, we have used the term sinner and we've weaponized it to beat people. It's actually not something to weaponize. It's actually a spiritual medical diagnosis so that we can get help. So first of all, what does sin even mean? Well, the word sin means to miss the mark. Well, God has a mark for human beings. God has a prototype of what he wants human beings to be. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, that Jesus is the last Adam. So Jesus in his humanity is what human beings were meant to to be. That God goes, here's the standard, here's the mark. And even if you're not convinced on Jesus yet, you got to admit, Jesus was pretty dope. If you're over 50, ask somebody that looks young, they'll tell you what that means. It means he's awesome. I, I, I mean, you have to admit the, the things that he did was pretty incredible. His life without sin. I mean, can you imagine for five seconds loving like Jesus and forgiving like Jesus and having compassion like Jesus and having intimacy with the Father like Jesus? Intimacy into me, you see. Could you imagine that? We don't have to imagine it. We can actually experience it. Jesus is the glory of God in human form. Let's run over to Romans chapter 3, verse 23 real quick, and it says this. For we have all sinned and fall short of God's glory. What is God's glory? God's glory, family, is Jesus. And all of us fall short of that. So therefore, God says, I love sinners 
because I want them in my family. I want them to know me. I want them to experience me. So what does God do? If we can't reach his glory, his glory came to reach us, and his name is Jesus. Now listen to this. No, you can go ahead and clap. Listen. Uh, for the minorities in the house, particularly the black people, clap so the white people can join us. You ain't got to be scared. Help them out now. All right? Yes, there we go. Okay. Some of you are like, did he just say that? Yes, stop taking yourself so seriously. <laughs> All right. So... Jesus is the glory of God. The glory comes to meet us. And never forget, get, get this. Jesus loves sinners like you and me because that's all he has to love. That's all that God has to love. Uh, let me put it to you this way. God loves busted up, toe up, from the flow up people. God loves you. Hold on. He doesn't love a better version of you. He doesn't love a fixed up version of you. He doesn't love the perfect version of you. He loves the you that you are right now in your addiction, in your brokenness. He loves you. And here's the key. When we understand that we gave God our worst and he still gave us our best, it is that love that transforms us. It's not about how much you love God. It's about how much God loves us. Now let's get to the sermon. <laughs> let's look at Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, and we're going to look at this incredible story. Luke was written by, you ready? This is deep, get ready to write this down. Luke. Luke was a Godim. He was an ethnos. He was a non-Jew. He was a Gentile. He was an outsider who met the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus. And so he has a way of writing for outsiders so that they could become insiders. Listen to this story that he describes. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. So a Pharisee invited Jesus to eat, which was a big deal. First of all, who's a Pharisee? The word Pharisee means separate one. The Pharisees were a group of Jewish men of about five to 7,000 in the first century. And they believed that it was their task to help all of Israel live what's called Torah. Torah is the first five books of the Bible. You can pretty much deduce that too. Love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But in their desire to help Israel live the Torah, they wrote a book, there was a book called the Talmud, which had 603 other laws. So therefore, by the time of the Pharisees, there were 613 laws that the Jewish people were to follow so that the Hamashiach or the Messiah could come and rid the promised land of the, Pentile, uh, 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 the Gentile pagan Romans. So that was the Pharisee. He invited Jesus, an upstart rabbi. Jesus was from Nazareth. Nazareth was the hood, the ghetto, the wrong side of the track. No rabbi would ever come from there of significance. It says this, he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So they would have reclined on their left side and the way homes were built back then, people actually could be outside of your house listening to your conversations and watching you eat. This is a big deal. A religious leader, a Pharisee, and an upstart Jewish rabbi eating and people are watching. First note, creepy. <laughs> I'm like, hi. So that's what's going down. Now, verse 37 is explosive family and a woman in town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisees house first of all a woman was not allowed to go into a Pharisee's house without her husband second of all a woman was not allowed to even speak to a rabbi let alone go to the house where he was having dinner Thirdly, it says that the woman was a sinner. We don't know what kind of sin she had. 
All we know is that she had a reputation of one who was not observant to the Jewish laws. She was an outcast and fourth. This is really important. There is an incredible power dynamic at play. Here's a woman with no power, bad reputation, knowing she should not go into a Pharisee's house. But I love this woman. You know why? Because she goes, I don't care. I don't care about the customs. I don't care about his religiosity. I don't care what people think. I am going to see Jesus. Question, who do you care about that's preventing you to see a deeper level of Jesus? Is it politics? Well, I know y'all be arguing on Facebook. <laughs> matter, matter of fact, the Bible says that you will know my disciples because they argue with people about politics on Facebook. <laughs> Doesn't it say that? Or does it say, you will know my disciples because they love one another? I'm just saying, I love the Bible. The Bible's good. We should read it more. (laughs) So, she goes, I don't care about that. I am going to see Jesus. What boldness, what faith to say, I don't care about cultural customs. I don't care what people think about me. I just want Jesus. And then watch what happens. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume. Alabaster was a city in Egypt, and that's where the perfume was developed. She would have wore her alabaster jar of perfume around her neck, and it was her diary from her family. This is what she was to give to her future husband. She brought it. This was her future. This was her future. This this was her all in all She brings an alabaster jar of perfume, and watch this, and stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She's she's weeping, she's crying, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She's she's washing his feet with her tears. She, She wiped his feet with her hair. In the first century, Second Temple Jewish context, a woman that was married and an upstanding woman that was not a prostitute would have had her hair in a bun. The fact that her hair was down maybe meant that she had a checkered past. But once again, Jesus loves people with checkered past. Jesus loves people who are broken and she is weeping and she is washing, yeah, 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 she is washing his feet. With her hair, and then look what she does, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. If there's any teenagers in the house or young Gen Z, please understand this. In first century, the Jewish world, the streets were not made of pavement. They were dusty. And so she is weeping and crying and kissing Jesus' feet and anointing them with her perfume. She's she's down on her knees, and she's weeping and crying and washing his feet, and, and she's pouring out her future on Jesus. She's pouring out her future on Jesus. I'm gonna say it one more time. She's pouring out her future on Jesus. And you know what's so awesome is when you and I pour out our future on Jesus, our future is taken care of, and not only that, our present and our past is erased. You can trust Jesus. Okay, 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 let's, let's do this. We don't have to be afraid of a global pandemic. We don't have to be afraid of political partisanship. We don't have to be afraid of anything. Christian, you don't have to be afraid. The end of the story has been told. The book has been written. There is a new heaven. There is a new earth. You can trust him with your future. Watch this, though. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, notice this, y'all ready? He said to himself, he didn't say it out loud, (laughs) Jesus hears us, he hears us, He, he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, the way this is written in the Greek language is like, see, I told you this guy was a lie. This man, if he was a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a Sinner. Now let's do some history here. To be considered of advancement, to become a Pharisee by the age of 12, you had to know from Genesis to Malachi, the 39 books of the Hebrew Bible, First Testament, Old Testament, whatever you want to call it, right? You had to know that in order to advance. So by age of 12, a Pharisee would have beat all of us in a game of Awanas. They knew the Bible. Isn't it sad 
that you can be so religious that you know the Bible that you miss God is at your table for dinner. I wonder, and hear my heart, let me pastor you today. I wonder how many of us have become so religious and judgmental that we miss Jesus. In response to his great love, she's crying and weeping. Look what Romans 5, 6 through 8 says. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at the right time and died for us sinners. That's me and you. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Watch this. But God. On the count of three, say but with me. One, two, three. But. Whenever you see but in the Bible, something big is about to happen. God loves big butts and he cannot lie. <laughs> Satan may try to deny. Seriously. I'm not talking about Sir Mix a lot. I'm talking about Sir Jesus. Whenever you see big in the Bible, whenever you see but in the Bible, something big is about to happen. Look at this. But God showed what? His great love for us by doing what? Sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, God is like, listen, I know you love me, but that's not what's important. What's most important is how much I love you. And when you know how much I love you, then like a rose blossoming to the sun, your love will blossom for me. So many of us are going, God, do I love you enough? Do I love you enough? And he's going, precious child, let me overwhelm you with my love. And you won't even have to ask about are you loving me enough because as we inhale, we exhale. When you inhale my love, you exhale love back unto me. Years ago, uh, and it still happens from time to time, but younger pastors will ask me, you know, pastor, you know, you have a doctorate, you've written books, and what's the greatest theological truth that you've ever learned? Like, what is it that moves your heart and your mind? And I say, okay, lean in. So I want you to lean in too, all right? Physically, just lean in. Uh, all, the, all the people watching online, lean in. Neptune, Jupiter, lean in. Here's what I learned the most. Write this down. This is so important. You ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Little ones to him belong, for we are weak and he is strong. Amen. Yeah. That's the greatest theological truth we can ever hold on to. You see, we shape our future self by knowing that Jesus loves us. And so we want to develop the holy habit of contemplating his love for us throughout the day. Number two, how do we learn to see what God sees when he sees you and me? By believing that Jesus graciously forgives our sins. He graciously does it. Young adults, teenagers, people exploring Christ, he graciously forgives our sins. We don't earn it. We don't achieve it. We don't perform for it. It is a pure gift. Let's get back to the story. Luke 7, 40 through 43. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Whenever Jesus says, I have something to say to you, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> you about to be made an example for all of eternity. <laughs> Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. A denarii was one day of working wages. 500 would have been an insurmountable amount to pay back. And the other 50, since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. He goes, you have judged correctly. Please listen. Shame and guilt are the twin brothers of soul destruction. Shame says this, you are 
your darkest moment. You are those heinous things. Guilt says you deserve punishment for those things. A lot of marriages and relationships are sabotaged because of guilt and shame in the past bearing weight in the present. Even as followers of Jesus, many of us are haunted by guilt and shame. We're haunted by the things that we've done. We're haunted by the things that even our spouses don't know. And, and we just seem to believe, well, 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 okay, God, I know you can forgive them, but can you really forgive me? I know that there's many watching, perhaps thousands going, well, I know Jesus forgives, but, but he can't forgive me. I've, I've just done too much. Um, can I put on my shoulder pads and spiritually jack you up in a loving way right now? I just want to put on my shoulder pads and just form tackle you in his grace. Listen, do you really think your sin is stronger than Jesus? Okay, I'm going to have a holy fit. You can join me if you want to. But let me remind you of who Jesus is. Let me give you his Instagram bio. He's the eternal son of God. He hails from eternity. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the king of kings. He is the great I am, the alpha, the omega, the first, and the last. He's the one who defeated sin and death and evil. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the great I am. He's the bread of life. He's the one in which angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. That's the Jesus, and your sin and my sin is not too strong for his blood. That's who he is. That's who he is. So you and I can bring our little busted up toe up selves to the king. And guess what? We'll find the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You don't have to live with shame and guilt, brothers and sisters. And there's a world filled with shame and guilt. Let them know that there's a shame remover and a guilt eraser. Let's let Ephesians chapter 1 Verses 6 and 7 just give us a shower of grace. So we praise God for the glorious grace he poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Because you belong to Jesus, all that's true of Jesus is now true of you. He is so rich in kindness and grace, what did he do? He purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. What is our freedom? I'm talking from a biblical perspective. We are free from sin and death and evil. That don't mean we're going to be sinless. It means we just have power over sin now. It means we're free from death because of the resurrection. It means we're free to defeat the evil one with Jesus' victory. Please understand this. Freedom is not doing what I want to do. That's what a five-year-old does. True freedom is loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Freedom is the capacity to love with no strings attached. You see, we shape our future self by contemplating the depths of God's forgiveness. Now, family, is forgiveness hard? Yeah. Is it tough? Yeah. Back in, uh, gosh, this is probably 2001, 2002, maybe even 2000. I can't remember. I have to look at my journals. But I had been a Christian for just a short time, and I was writing letters to family and friends, and I was like, Jesus is awesome. He'll forgive you. Like, I was that brand-new Christian that, regardless of the conversation, I'm going to tell you about Christ. You'd be like, hey, Derwin, what's up, man? It's a beautiful day. Man, it is a beautiful day. 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, <laughs> it was a beautiful day. Man, Derwin, did you watch the game? Yeah, I watched the game. Well, let me tell you about the real game. Let me tell you about the Super Bowl. 2000. <laughs> so anyway, I'm writing these letters, right? And I hear a voice. I'm not saying it's God's voice, but it wasn't my voice. And the voice said this, find your father. So my father uh, suffered from 
uh, mental health issues, substance abuse. And, you know, when you're 13, 14, you just, you just know your dad's not there. So can you imagine having a son that plays in the NFL and you don't even go to a middle school game, a high school game, or a college game? And so a lot of my motivation to succeed was I want to show him I can make it without him, which the fact that that was my motivation showed that I was actually wounded and hurt. Listen, you cannot outperform your wounds. You cannot outachieve your wounds. You can cover them up for a little bit, but they're just Band-Aids. You have to go to the wound healer, and that's Jesus. So when I heard the voice, go find your father, I literally, uh, the word wasn't around then, but I was triggered. I was on the ground cussing. Now, I ain't talking about little cussing. I ain't talking about Christian cussing. I'm talking F-bombs, and I'm just, he doesn't deserve me to blankety-blank find him. And where was he when I was sexually molested? And, and, and where was he when I needed to learn how to treat w w women? And, and where was he? And, and I was just going off, and I was just in a puddle of tears in my office all alone. It was almost like God gently scooped me up, put me on his lap, grabbed my head, moved it to his chest, and said, son, you're right. It does hurt. And you're right, he, he doesn't deserve you to go find him. But never forget, you didn't deserve my son Jesus going to find you. You forgive him the way he's forgiven you. Now let me pause here. Forgiveness does not mean staying in a physically abusive relationship or an emotionally abusive relationship. That's called enabling bad habits, and that's toxic, and it's sinful, and it's wrong. When I'm talking about forgiveness, I'm talking about saying, I no longer give you the right to hurt me. I'm going to release you the way God has forgiven me, and I'm going to try to have peace with you, which I was able to do. But here's the thing. I was only able to forgive as I contemplated the depths of God's forgiveness for me. Maybe your alabaster jar that you need to pour out is you have unforgiveness stored up. It's time to pour it out. How do we learn to see what God sees when he sees you? Number three, by believing that Jesus redeems us from sin so we can worship God. Um, I'm going to let you write that down. And I have to admit, as I was writing that last point, I thought, man, I, I need a more riveting point, something more exciting. And God was like, what can actually be more exciting than worshiping me? And I said, well, no, no, I get it, Lord, but I, I mean, I need it to rhyme. He goes, no, 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 no. This is, this is good. This is good. And here's why. God does not forgive us from sin God does not rescue us from death. God does not defeat the devil so our dreams can happen, so I can get my personal fulfillment. He does it, one, because he loves us, and two, he has a purpose for us. Matter of fact, we should be purpose-driven, and that purpose that drives us is God says that when you see me, that when you love me, you become like the one you see and you love. God doesn't need our worship. We need to worship him because that's what we were created for, and worship is not just singing songs. Songs. The greatest worship song ever sung is a life of obedience to King Jesus. He's setting us free. Watch what worship looks like. I love this. I love this. Turning to the woman. Oh, I've never seen this before. I think there's a picture here. The Bible says that we Christians are the bride of Christ. Male and f female. So Jesus turns to us. That's pretty cool. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Ooh, uh, he is about to put this religious Pharisee on blast. <laughs> he watched this. He said, Simon, do you see this woman? You know, the one that you said is a sinner. I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. It was Jewish custom in the first century. That at the front door was a basin of water. Why? Because the roads were dusty. And Jewish hospitality says, your lower servant in the house or yourself, you go to that water basin and you wash your guest's feet to welcome them. Here's the religious leader who doesn't do it, but a sinner does. Wow. 
oh, the surgery's just beginning. <laughs> but she, with tears, has washed my feet. Notice, water comes from without, tears come from within. Within her is her worship because of his forgiveness and grace and acceptance. And she took her hair to wash his feet. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. Another customary thing for guests is you gave them a kiss on the cheek. And she is kissing Jesus' feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with her perfume. She took her future dowry and she is pouring it out on the feet of Jesus. Can you imagine the scene all around town? Oh my gosh, the woman who is a sinner, the woman with the bad reputation is at Jesus' feet and it's, a, it's chaotic, it's beautiful chaos. She's weeping and crying and hair is everywhere and she takes her future and she's pouring it out on Jesus' feet and she's weeping and crying. In that moment is this holy moment that she sees what she was created for, worship. And here's the great thing. Oh my God, here's the great thing. When you get down on your knees to worship, then you can truly stand up to walk. He goes on. This is one of the first scriptures I memorized as a brand new Christian. Verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved so much. But the one who's forgiven little loves little. Isn't it sad you had a religious leader with full of biblical knowledge and little love? Verse 48, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? Mark chapter 2 verses 5 through 7 recognizes that only God could forgive sins. The Pharisee had God the Son in his house, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great I am was in his house, and he didn't know it, but a woman who potentially was a prostitute did. He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. How do we begin to see what God sees? We remember that he redeemed us to worship him. We remember that we have been graciously forgiven of our sins. We remember that we are loved, that we contemplate these things all day. The scene of the crime is your mind, and so God wants to fill us. We name Transformation Church out of Romans 12 to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We develop holy habits from holy thoughts. As we can see from this incredible story, worship is motivated by grace. Worship is sacrificial. And something else I should add is it's courageous. Can you imagine that woman in that society saying, I don't care about these people. I'm going to see Jesus. For some of you, there are some relationships that are keeping you from seeing the fullness of Jesus. It's servant-oriented, and it's financially generous. If you want to know what a man or woman believes about Jesus, don't ask them. Just say, let me see your checkbook. For where your heart is, your treasure will be there also. At the end of sermons at Transformation Church, I, I call it a soul tattoo. What, what, what's, the, what's the big idea? Teenagers and young adults, what's the big idea? Here, here, here it is. It's time for you to break your alabaster jar at the feet of Jesus. What is your alabaster jar? Is it, is it unforgiveness? I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. But you shape your future self by seeing what God sees. And what God sees is one who is loved, one who is forgiven, and one who is set free to worship. Those are not things you achieve, that's what we believe. And out of what we believe, it is conceived into the world. It gives life. This is what, this is what I want to do. I'm going to pray for those of you who are yet to follow Jesus. And then I'm going to pray for those of us who do follow him, but 
our alabaster jars are still full. Will you pray with me? I want to pray right now for those of you that are online, whether if it's Facebook or whatever it may be, and those who are physically here. That in this moment right now, you're saying, you know what, Pastor Derwin, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'm ready to be forgiven. I, I'm ready to receive love. I've been looking for love in all the wrong places, but I found out that love has found me in the person of Jesus. And I want to be loved. I want to be forgiven. I want to be made new. I want to give my life to him. Today, would you, would you run into the arms of Jesus? Today, would you bring your hurt, your pain, and your sin to Jesus? If you're ready to give your life to him in the silence of your heart, I want you to say this. King Jesus, today I say yes to your invitation of grace. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that upon that bloody rugged cross you died for me in my place to give me grace. I believe that your precious blood forever forgives me. Motivation was love. And I believe that on the third day you conquered death. And when you rose up out of that tomb, you brought me with you. And now I'm the dwelling place of the spirit. I'm a part of your family called the body of Christ. I receive this free gift. Next, I want to pray for followers of Jesus that it's time for you to break open your alabaster jar. It's time for you to remove the cap and just pour out on Jesus. I don't know what it is. You know what it is. Just give it to him. He's gracious and he's kind and he's good. In response to his forgiveness, give it to him. Lord, may we be a people that we shape our future self by remembering how you see us. As loved, forgiven, and redeemed worshipers. We pray this in the name of King Jesus and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, Saddleback Church.